All right, um, Brennan Bush, where are you? There's Old Daily News. I saved it since February. Isn't that you? Yes, it is. Okay. okay. Thank you. Yeah. Brendan's picture is in February before the COVID thing hit. Hills of Daily News for his basketball prowess. Um, all right. Um, giving away two things that may have zero marginal benefit, but does anybody need a three ring binder? Anybody want to get use for a three ring binder? Okay, all right, there we go. And that back, all right. And what about a one of these things? Anybody want one of these? Okay, Brendan's got one. Okay, we got okay, good. All right. Um so last time we were uh discussing elasticity, right? And we said that elasticity um is a number, right? And it is the absolute value of the percentage change in quantity divided by the percentage change in price. And why do I really care about that? I care about that because if I'm moving along a demand curve, then as the price goes down, quantity's going up. And as price goes up, quantity's going down. And I want to find out what's going to happen to P times Q, right? Total revenue. Or if you're looking at it from the spending side, total expenditure. How much will people spend on, on something? If I want to know how much people are going to spend uh, on um, COVID masks, right? If I lower the price of COVID masks by a certain amount, uh, price is going to go down, but Q is going to go up. How much are people going to spend? Don't know unless you tell me the elasticity, and we said that elasticity, we use epsilon to be that, we said it's the percentage change in quantity divided by the percentage change in price, and we put an absolute value sign on that because that number is always negative because it's downward sloping, um, and what we're, gonna, we're gonna wanna know whether elasticity is bigger than one, or elasticity is less than one, or uh, it's possible that elasticity is, uh, is uh, uh, equal to one. Now, um, so just a, a few observations. One is it's not the slope, right? Elasticity is not the slope. So let's think, let's just again set the Wayback Machine to uh, eighth grade or whenever you did fractions. Uh, what is it? It's delta Q over Q uh, divided by delta P over P. But what is that? That's delta Q over Q times P over delta P, right? Because that's how you divide fractions. You flip them and multiply them. But if we look at that, that's delta Q times delta P times P over Q. But what is that thing? That's the one, one over the slope, right? Because the slope of a demand curve with P and Q the slope of the demand curve is delta P over delta Q. So this is equal to one over the slope times P over Q, right? So elasticity is not the slope. I can't look at a demand curve and look at the slope and say, oh, it's the elasticity is bigger than one or the elasticity is less than one or it's equal to one. I can't do that by just looking at the slope. Just conceptually, you might think about it because I might be looking at, if I look at the price of gasoline in terms of liters, or I look at gasoline in terms of barrels, the slope's gonna change, right? The relationship's not gonna change, but the slope will change based on with what Q is, right? Um, so anyway, let's think about that. What if you have a straight line demand curve? What's true about the slope of a, of a straight line? What? Constant. It's constant, right? Just afraid to say something, right? Because you know you're on, you're on the YouTube video, right? Um, although they can't see you, they can just maybe hear you. Probably not very well because the microphone's here and you're out there. But so anyway, uh, it's constant, right? constant slope of a straight line. But if the elasticity is one over the slope times P over Q, and the slope's constant, 
And P over Q has got to be changing, right? Everywhere along here, P divided by Q is different. What does that mean? It means that the elasticity changes. The elasticity is different at every point. Right? So it turns out, if you do a little mathematics, like I'm probably you might do in uh, Econ uh, 303 or whatever, but you do a little mathematics, and it'll turn out that the elasticity is equal to 1 at the midpoint of this. If we were to take the demand curve and we were to make it like that, the elasticity is equal to 1 there. And the elasticity is going to be less than 1 if you sort of think about it. Where is the elasticity is going to be less than one either here or here? But if you sort of think about it, the percentage change in quantity divided by the percentage change in price is going to be smaller down here, right? And so it's going to be less than one in that range, and it's going to be bigger than one in that range. So what we, you know, again, the point being that Elasticity can be different at every point, and it's not, so it's not the slope. It's 1 over the slope times p over q, right? And on a straight line demand curve, uh, the elasticity is going to be equal to 1 at the midpoint, less than 1 any point below that, and greater than 1 uh, at uh, points above that. Well, we also might have it if you had a demand curve that were what's called a rectangular hyperbola. That's rectangular for rectangular, hyperbola for hyperbola, rectangular hyperbola. Okay? And uh, anybody know what the characteristic of a rectangular hyperbola is? Anybody had mathematics here? No? Okay, a rectangular hyperbola has a characteristic that any rectangle that I draw from this axis to the, to the hyperbola, a hyperbola is a curve that looks like that, right? A rectangular one um, has the characteristic that if I take the rectangle formed by this axis times that axis, all the same area, okay? A rectangular hyperbola has a characteristic that they all have the same area. So if I take that area of that rectangle and I take the area of that rectangle and I take the area of that rectangle, they all have the same area. But what is the area? P times Q, right? That's what the area is. It's going to be P times Q which says that P times Q is the same everywhere, but if P times Q is the same, then the elasticity must be equal to 1, right? The percentage change in quantity had to be equal to the percentage change in price, so the elasticity is 1 at every point here. So you could have a demand curve where the elasticity changes at every point. You could have a demand curve where the elasticity is the same at every point. What does that tell you? It tells you that I can't say this is an elastic demand curve, right? I can't say this is an inelastic, well, I haven't mentioned that yet. So we might as well just define that. We're going to define elasticity. We're going to say if the elasticity is bigger than 1, we're going to call that elastic. And if the elasticity is less than 1, we're going to call that inelastic. And if the elasticity is equal to 1, we're going to call that unitary elastic. Okay? Definition then. If I say the, 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 uh, it's inelastic, I'm not saying something like, again, you know, what Will Rogers said, you know, it ain't what you don't know that's the problem, it's what you know that ain't so that's the problem. You know, I've been teaching this class since 1989. Um, 
always I'll get people telling me if it's inelastic, then when the price changes, people, people don't change how much they buy or something like that, right? That's not what inelastic, inelastic means. It doesn't have to do with some sort of conceptual thing, right? Inelastic is like force equals mass times acceleration, right? If it's inelastic, it means that the percentage change in quantity is less than the percentage change in price. So that number, the elasticity number, is less than one. So if I change the price by 10%, let's say I raise the price by 10%, right? And you guys, uh, uh, if, I, if I raise the price by 10%, put it this way, and what happens is that you guys uh, uh, lower quantity by 9%, then it's inelastic. You still changed quite a bit, right? You, 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 you lowered Q by 9%. So it's not a matter of, oh, people you know, kept buying it, right? They reduced their, their people did keep buying it, right? Q didn't go to zero. But the, it, it, it is a matter not of um, somehow saying that people don't react very much or whatever. People were reacting a lot. It's just a matter of did they react more in terms of Q than what happened in terms of P, okay? So if it's inelastic, then it says that number is less than one. If it's elastic, that number is bigger than one. If it is equal to one, then it's unitary elastic. So I know that what's going to happen to P times Q if you're told, if I said to you, suppose the demand for applesauce is inelastic, and you know if you look, again, Look at the old exams, right? You'll notice I'll always ask a 10-point question, and as part of that 10-point question, I'll say, suppose the demand for a certain good, whatever it is, is elastic or inelastic, but then I'll say in the relevant range, right? In the relevant range tells you that in the area of the demand curve that we're talking about, it's, it's inelastic, right? Because Again, if you've had any calculus, what you're really doing is uh, you're taking the, the, the first derivative, you're taking the inverse of the first derivative and multiplying times p over q. So again, we're drawing continuous demand curves. Um, if we're drawing continuous demand curves, then we're, we're going to say that it's the, the part of the story that I'm telling you in, it's inelastic in this range, and then tell me what happens to p times q, right? So if I tell you it's inelastic in the relevant range and the price went up, then you're going to tell me P times Q went up. If I tell you that it's elastic in the relevant range and something happens to the story to make P go up, then you're going to say P times Q went down. Okay? But you have a question, yeah? No? Okay. All right. Okay. So uh, again, like I, like I said before, elasticity can change at any, at any particular point, and that is, uh, that is why, again, when you see the exams, it'll say, uh, suppose that it's elastic or inelastic in the relevant range. Uh, again, um, if, you, uh, if you've had any calculus, what's really going on is you're taking the derivative of that continuous function and multiplying it by p over q, uh, or taking the inverse of the derivative and multiplying it times p over q, and so that's why it could, it could change at every point. But again, like I said, with a rectangular hyperbola, it could be the same at every point. So I need to know where I am on the demand curve. Again, I can't say, oh, that's an elastic demand curve, or oh, that's an inelastic demand curve. But there's extremes. Um, so uh, the two extremes are, one is you might have what's called perfectly inelastic. And in a perfectly inelastic demand curve, what does that say? It says that the percentage change in Q is equal to zero. So that tells you that the elasticity is equal to zero. Right? So what would, again, if we, 
take Rod Stewart and we go, every picture tells a story, and we go to draw a story for that. It's going to look like that, right? That's what the demand. If what I did is I said the percentage change in Q is zero, then no matter what the price, P stays the same, right? That is a very unlikely thing to happen um, because your income is not going to be enough that you could continually buy the thing ad infinitum, right? At some, even, even if you were addicted to heroin, right, or you're addicted to uh, crystallized methamphetamine, you know? And so I said, well, if I increase the price by 10%, are you still going to buy the same amount of crystallized methamphetamine? And it might be that you would, right? But at some point, you're going to run out of money, right? And at some point, or you either not run out of money or you're not going to be able to buy food or something like that. So it's possible that you might see a demand curve where uh, a portion of it looks like that, right? It might be that you might see a demand curve that looks like this. But eventually it's got to go that way, right? Eventually it's got, and notice that Think about why things might be inelastic at low prices. Suppose that you buy, um, suppose you're buying candy bars over at the, at the bookstore, right? Um, and uh, you buy, let's say you buy a candy bar every day and it's 50 cents, okay? So then the price of candy bars goes up by 10 cents, or 10% to 55 cents. Well, you might still buy the same amount of candy bars. If it's a good where, you, where it's not a big portion of your budget and the price is relatively low, it's quite possible that delta Q is going to be zero for a while. But candy, gar, candy bars go to $5, you're going to say, mm, hey, maybe I just don't need that candy bar today, right? So we would expect that it's possible that you could have a perfectly inelastic demand curve, which is what this is. but not likely, it's more probable that you have a portion of the demand curve that might be perfectly inelastic. And again, when we noted that if you had a straight line demand curve, it's, it's going to be inelastic down here and it's going to be elastic up there, at lower prices, it tends to be more likely that a percentage change in quantity is not going to be as much as the percentage change in price. Yeah. Well, can't think of a historical example of a perfectly inelastic demand curve. And, and you're thinking about an individual. We're still talking about individuals here. But, the, but this, what would have to happen, of course, is the sum of the individual. If we're talking about the market demand for something, it's the sum of the individual demand curves, right? So we'd have to have a situation where the sum of the individual demand curves, if I was talking about Dan Gilbert, right, and trying to decide what the price he ought to set on uh, Cleveland Cavaliers basketball games, he's looking at what's the market demand for Cleveland Cavaliers basketball games. And it would have to be some sort of weird situation where no matter what price he charged, he'd still get the same amount of people showing up to the Cleveland Cavaliers games. Now think about that. What's the odds of that, right? If he sets it at $15,000 a seat, is he still going to get the same amount of people as at, if, at $15 a seat? Right. Doesn't seem likely. So um, you can think of it perfectly elastic, and that is um, uh, uh, certainly I can draw a picture of it, but is it likely to exist in the real life? Probably not. It might exist for a... A, a, the lower portion of the demand curve, but it's not likely to happen over the whole demand curve. Now, we could have a perfectly elastic demand curve, and it turns out that when you take Econ 202, this is something that you're going to assume happens. And a perfectly elastic demand curve, perfectly elastic demand curve, says that I can sell all I want at the same price 
And if I were to raise my price by, so why would I raise my price by a little bit, right? Because you're going to sell the same amount at that price. And if I lower my price below that, it goes to zero. I don't sell anything, okay? And what you'll find is when you do an analysis of competitive firms, when you take Econ 202, what's going to happen is you're going to assume that each individual, each individual firm in a competitive market, each individual firm is so small that they don't affect the overall market demand. That is, excuse me, well, we haven't got to the supply yet. But basically, they don't affect the overall market supply, so they don't affect the price in the market as a whole. So if you are, an example you might always give is uh, you're, a, uh, uh, you're growing corn here in Hillsdale County, um, and uh, you uh, uh, go down to Maumee uh, to sell your corn, uh, where this is where mo most people go to, to sell their corn. Um, and you go down to sell your corn in Maumee, um, you're not going to show up and uh, if you try to sell uh, 15 more bushels, you've got to lower the price, right? Uh, if you listen to WCSR, uh, they give the grain report every day um, to your local radio station, right? And they'll, they'll tell you what the price of corn is, right? And what are they talking about? The price of corn down in Maumee. And so I know if I'm a farmer, I can go out and I can sell my corn at that price. Why? Because I'm so small that I'm not going to affect what's going on in the overall market. So when you take Econ 202, what you're going to do is you're going to assume that a competitive market, and a, excuse me, a competitive firm has a perfectly elastic demand curve. That is, the, the, uh, you know, they can sell all they want at the same, uh, at, whatever the market, at whatever the market price is. And they'll tell you some story about, well, they're so small, da 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 da. Um, but basically, they want to make it so that you're a, what's called a price taker. You, you, as the individual farmer, are so small that you can't affect what the price is of, you know, of corn is. You take that price as given, and then you go in and act that way. All right? So, again, uh, two extremes, we will assume that the demand curve, we'll mainly be talking about either individual demand curves or we'll talk about uh, you know, your, your individual demand curve or the market demand curve uh, and that it will be downward sloping, right? It won't be perfectly inelastic or it won't be perfectly uh, elastic. Last point about elasticity is you might want to price discriminate. That is, I might want to charge a different price, if, if I can find out a way to charge a different price between two groups of customers, right? I can charge, we're going to assume you can charge a different price. Uh, for uh, different customers. Suppose you can do that, right? You're trying to set your price in a way that you're going to charge one price to one type of folk and another price to the other. So if you could do that, if what you could do is you could say, you know what, if I can break my demand into people who have elastic demand and people who have inelastic demand, then what I would do is I would raise the price on those um, have, whose, uh, you know, whose demand is inelastic at that point, right? And what would happen? P times Q would go up, and I would lower the price for uh, people uh, whose demand is elastic, right? Whose elasticity is bigger than one at that price or at that point, at wherever you are, right? So then what would happen is P times Q would go up for that piece, okay? Where do you see that? You see, I mean, pre-COVID, right? You see that in airline, right? Airline prices. Go to buy, uh, let's say you want to fly to, again, pre-COVID, 
Um, if you wanted to fly to San Francisco and you, this was a, uh, a, a Thursday, and you wanted to fly tomorrow, right? I got news for you, it's gonna be really expensive. If you wanna fly 30 days out, it'll be a lot cheaper. Now, it's not because people who need to fly sooner take up more room and so the plane's gotta use more fuel to get there or whatever. No, what are they trying to do? They're assuming that if you need to get there tomorrow, your demand is more inelastic than somebody who's deciding whether to leave uh, in 30 days. Maybe they're going on vacation and they're gonna decide whether to fly or whether to drive or whatever. So when there's a price differential, what, what you, if there's a price differential, what you, what's happening is the people who are setting the price for American Airlines, or United Airlines or whatever, what are they doing? They're trying to guess, hey, can we find a way? I mean, it costs the same to have you fly, right? We're gonna to try to find a way that we can identify those people with inelastic demand at the, whatever point price we're at. And at that, at that queue, we're finding people whose demand is inelastic at that point. We're raising the price of those and we're lowering the price on others. Go to the movies, right? They will have a student discount, right? I don't know if you ever, anybody ever seen where you went to a movie and there's a student discount? Yeah, okay, right. Guess what? It's for high school students. It's not really for college students usually. Why is that? Well, because let's say you're uh, asking, uh, you know, you're asking a girl out on a date. Um, in your high school, you're, you might think, mm, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna find out how much it costs to go to the movies versus going to the bowling alley. And I'm gonna ask, do you wanna go to the bowling alley if the price of movies is really high? Whereas if you're a college student, you might, and uh, you know, uh, you ask a girl out and she goes, oh, I really want to go see, you know, the latest Marvel, tell, you know, the latest Marvel movie. And you're going to go, you know what, it's $12 and uh, hey, why don't we just go bowling instead, right? That ain't going to happen. So what are they trying to do? They're tr uh, senior discounts at the restaurant, right? What's a senior discount at the restaurant? They must, if the seniors are getting a discount at the restaurant, it must be that they think that their demand is more elastic. They're more likely to go to the restaurant uh, if you change the, if you lower the price for them, they're more likely to increase their demand for restaurant meals than if you're not a senior, okay? So people who are pricing for, in, and you know, there's lots of people out there that have jobs trying to set the price of different things. If you can, if you can have a way of Chain, uh, of looking at subsets of, of your customer base and have a mechanism to try to figure out who's more likely to respond to a price change in terms of the percentage change in quantity being less than the percentage change in price, then you'd want to raise the price on those folks. If you find people that the percentage change in quantity is lower than the percentage change in price, um, uh, excuse me, if the percentage change in quantity is higher than the percentage change in price, then I'm gonna try to uh, lower the, the price for those folks if you're trying to uh, maximize what your revenue is. So anyway, um, that, that's, a, uh, that's an explanation of why you see price discrimination. Yeah? Can you read what the left side of the blue says, If I can do what? Can you like, read what the left side of the blue says, It says, you'll raise the price on those with inelastic at that point, so P times Q will go up, and you lower the price for people uh, whose elasticity is bigger uh, than bigger than one uh, at that point. Okay. So again, it's not uncommon to see different prices for seniors and non-seniors. I mean, it tends to be students and non-students, or seniors and non-seniors, or time that you have. You know, if I need it right away, you're likely to get charged more than if you can pick it at a different time. Yeah. What was that? Would like express or like uh, overnight shipping be an example? Overnight shipping would be an example of that, right? It tends to cost, you know, you're gonna pay more for overnight shipping, even though it doesn't cost any more for them to deliver the package. That's a good, that's a good example, uh, overnight shipping. All right, before we move on to, so that concludes the chapter on demand. Before we move on to 
supply. Uh, when I wanted, I forgot to tell you the classic album of the week. Um, the classic album of the week is Warren Zevon's Excitable Boy. Okay, how many how many have heard of Warren Zevon? Okay, a few of you, right? Um, how many have heard of the song Werewolves of London? All right, yeah, Werewolves. Well, it's on this album. Okay, um, uh, I. Uh, I picked this one because in my law and economics classes right before you, we're talking, we were talking about uh, different uh, civil law versus common law and how, uh, the, uh, how uh, civil law tends to be an adversarial process um, uh, where the, um, there's a song called uh, Send Lawyers, Guns, and Money on, the, on this one. Uh, and so uh, it's about, uh, you know, send lawyers, guns, and money. That'd get me out of here. Um, so uh, if you, uh, you know, want to spend a lot of money and have a good lawyer, you can get out. Anyway, so that's why uh, the Excitable Boy was chosen as the uh, classic album of the week. But yeah, Warren Zevon, uh, again, Werewolves of London, uh, a lot of really good songs on this album. So if you get a chance, you can get on Spotify or whatever and, and take a listen. All right. So now we're going to move on to supply. And of course, what we're going to eventually do is put the demand and supply together. And that's going to determine what the price looks like. Uh, so what we're going to do is, when we go to talk about supply, we're going to introduce a concept called opportunity cost. And the opportunity cost of something is the value of the next best alternative. Right? Um, you have to give up something to get something. Right? Um, and, the, and the question then is, um, what am I giving, what's, what's the next best thing that I'm giving up? Right? So if it costs you, uh, I don't even know how much, uh, they, they, sell LPs again now, right? The sort of LPs of vinyl, vinyls come back. So if you go to Checker Records, you can buy a, a, a vinyl. Um, but uh, who knows? I mean, you used to be able to buy them for $2.50, okay? The, any, anybody bought a vinyl lately? How much are they, Bob? I mean, $40. $40? Depending on how popular it is. Whoa, okay. Um, so let's say you buy, uh, you know, a, a vinyl record for $40. When you decide to buy that, you're thinking, what else could I do with the $40, right? What's the next best thing that I could do with the $40? If you end up buying it, then you would have decided, I value that album more than whatever else I could have bought with the $40. So opportunity cost is the value of this next best alternative. Um, it's a concept that can explain a lot of things, if you just sort of think about it. Um, what about a military draft? Okay. Now, when I was your age, we had a flu pandemic going on, right? In fact, in terms of deaths per capita, it has just, in the United States, it just recently was passed by COVID-19, okay? Um, this was, uh, uh, and of course, uh, in that same period, um, we had Woodstock, right? So the, and you've heard of Woodstock, right? Um, so uh, we, things were very different in those days. Um, but we also had going on uh, in 1968, 69, uh, uh, was um, the Vietnam War was going on, right? And instead of having uh, demonstrations with regard to uh, race relations or whatever, um, the demonstrations had to do with the Vietnam War, right? But it was primarily about the military draft, that is, in those days, uh, you didn't volunteer to join the army. Um, what happened? You got drafted to join the army, right? And what did that mean? You went into the army if you got drafted, okay? Now, 
Um, you might think of the efficiency of such a thing. That is, does, that, does a military draft, is that an efficient way to get people uh, into the armed forces? And uh, certainly it's less expensive because I'm going to pay you, you know, whatever it was in those days, you know, $125 a month uh, as a private and you come, right? And you can't just, you know, you can flee to Canada or something or whatever. Um, but, but basically for most people, what happens is they pay you the $125 and you're in the army. Well, if we look at the expenditures of your federal government to fund the army, that looks like a very cheap way to do it, okay? But if you think about opportunity cost, it's a very inefficient. It's very expensive to do a draft. And why is that? Because think about what's the opportunity cost of the draftee. What is that? That's what you're giving up. Like if I, if I draft you, we're giving up in the economy whatever else you could have been producing. So suppose that you could be a, uh, uh, let's say you were a, a doctor and you produce $50,000 a year in uh, medical services. Okay? If I draft you and I pay you $5,000 a year, okay, that certainly saved the federal government the $45,000, but the economy as a whole, just, it just cost them. If the value of your, uh, if the value of your services as a private if that equaled five thousand dollars what was the opportunity cost the opportunity cost was fifty thousand dollars so it just cost forty five thousand dollars to draft that person right then here's the problem I don't know what the opportunity cost of all these people are and so a, a draft is a very inefficient way to, to uh, have an army, um, to, to raise an army, and I wouldn't, if I hadn't thought of opportunity cost, I might not realize that, right? Now, um, it may be that you think it's more fair to do a draft, right? Uh, I believe that uh, in uh, Israel it has a draft. Um, well, as long as, and again, in, in this class or any economics class, if you, want to, if you want to have a draft, this isn't saying that a draft isn't the right thing to do. What it's saying is you have to know what you're giving up when you do that, right? And if you say, hey, you know, uh, it costs an extra uh, $50 billion a year in, in, the, in lost production in order to have a draft, and we're, you know, and we think that's, you know, we're pursuing, that's fine. Yeah, you know, in economics, we're not saying, oh, a draft is a stupid idea. All we're saying is seeing and observing, right? It's a matter of seeing and observing. As long as you observe what's going on, you're right? As long as, well, you know, so think back to Sherlock Holmes, that's what we're talking about. As long as you observe that you've got this opportunity cost for a draft and you decide to do it anyway, that's fine, but you can't not observe. You can't just see, oh, it's really cheap to, 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 you know, to have people in a draft, um, and so uh, it must be the right thing to do, right? It may be the right thing to do, but, uh, the, but uh, it turns out that that decision to do the draft changed, right? And we don't have a military draft today. Right? We have, what, 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 what is it called? It's called a volunteer army. But if you're an economist, you'd say, well, it's not really a volunteer army, is it? Right? A volunteer army says you just 
go off and do it. You get paid, right? So it's, it's a professional army. And if you were to, this, you know, if, as an economist, you'd say, oh, this is really not a volunteer army, it's a professional army. Um, but, you know, that's the term that we use. But what are we really saying? We, we altered it so that you don't have the draft anymore in the United States. So what must have happened? We must have thought through and said, okay, we think that the uh, fairness uh, issue of everybody ought to, you know, be in the armed forces, that we think that fairness issue uh, isn't purchased b enough by, uh, you know, uh, by the opportunity cost of what we're giving up in order to do that. I know that anybody that shows up in the, in the Army must have felt that the opportunity cost of their time is less than what they're getting paid, right? Otherwise, they wouldn't be there. Um, and so that, that, that's just one issue that, yeah, do you have a? Yeah, I was just going to say, obviously, not necessarily this example, but they could also, for the government, the opportunity cost could be inefficient as well, just in terms of tax revenue that could be created by this person that they've now drafted. That, that's a, yeah, that's another good point. There's an observation is that um, the, the government is also, is also giving up the tax revenue that this person would have uh, have contributed as a, uh, not contributed, but got pulled in uh, uh, as, a, as, a, as a doctor. So again, the important thing is to, to, to see and observe. Let's observe what's going on. Um, again, pre-COVID, um, a, uh, a lot of Division I basketball players never finished college, right? Say, so, okay, wow, you know, I'm looking at University of North Carolina and, um, their, you know, their students never, never finish college, okay? Is that because uh, they can't, uh, you know, they're, they're just not smart enough to finish college or whatever, or is it some sort of uh, problem with the University of North Carolina's uh, 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 basketball program that they, none of their students, are they are bringing in students that just aren't, you know, to play basketball, they just aren't smart enough? No. What is, what is basketball, play, you know, Division I basketball players? What do you got to look at? This is the opportunity cost of, uh, of a college basketball player. LeBron James didn't even go to high school, or didn't even go to college, right? Do you think that, uh, you know, Hillsdale College could have offered LeBron James a, 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 a full scholarship, and LeBron would have said, oh, I'm, I'm in Hillsdale. No, right? The opportunity cost of his time, enormous. Millions of dollars, multi-millions of dollars. Any, and, and that's why you see a lot of Division I basketball players are not finishing college because to go to another uh, a year of college is costing them a lot more than it's costing you guys to go to college, right? Guarantee you, none of you people could be playing in the NBA, you know, or the women's, you know, national, uh, women's, what, WNBA, um, uh, none of you in this room could be doing that, right? Because you, unless you really liked Hillsdale College, <laughs> right? Um, uh, you know, the opportunity cost of your time is just so high. So again, it's a matter of seeing and, uh, uh, and, uh, and, and, and observing. Just other things. Um, it turns out that, uh, it turns out that in Michigan, you had a lot of people that didn't go to college. Um, if you looked at the percentage of people that went to college, and if you look back, percentage of people that went to college, um, particularly in the 1960s, 1970s, 1980s, it was low uh, relative to other states. Why was that? Because there was a lot of automobile manufacturing jobs in the United in Michigan, and they paid a lot of money, so that if I could make forty thousand dollars a year working in the in the Ford you know motor company plant, uh, the cost of me going to college is not just the tuition, but the forty thousand dollars a year I could be making somewhere you know at, at the at, at the plant. So we observed that, uh, uh, and of course now. Uh, we don't, we, it turns out that we produce more automobiles than we did, but we use a lot less labor, and we'll, we'll talk about why that is later on. But uh, the, the, the point is, is that you can start thinking about, why doesn't an attorney, you know, making $300 an hour, uh, they're not going to change the oil in their car, 
unless they really like it, if they enjoy it, right, they may do it. But what's going on? If, if I'm changing the oil in my car, I'm giving up $300 an hour worth of services that I could have been providing. Very expensive oil change, right? I'm going to take it down to glory to God. They're going to charge me $28, uh, and uh, Rob Schumann's going to charge me my, the, the $28, bucks, and it's, it's going to be done, right? I used to have a filter wrench and used to change the oil in my 1975 Dodge pickup, right? Uh, why did I do that? Because the opportunity cost of my time was not as high as it is now. Got news for you. I haven't changed the oil in my car in who knows how long, right? I, I don't even know where the oil filter is on my cars that I own today, right? Um, and, and, and why is that? Because the opportunity cost my time is much greater than it was when I was a college student, right? Um, and so, again, we can think through all sorts of things. Riding the bus, right? How many in here know how much it costs to ride the bus in your hometown? How much does it cost? $2, I think. Okay. Why, why don't you know? You're not going to ride the bus, are you? Right? Because what's the real cost of riding the bus? It's not the $2, it's the time involved, right? You got to wait for the bus, you got to get on the bus, ride the bus, maybe you got to get off and change buses to get where you're going to go, wherever, you, wherever the bus ends, you got to walk to wherever you're going, right? You're not going to do that. How, if I wanted to increase or say, oh, you know what we want to do? We want to increase people's use of mass transit. How can I do that? I can make it so that the time involved in driving your car is greater than the time that it takes to take the, to take the mass transit. And so where do you find that people are riding the subway, right? New York or riding the L in Chicago, okay? Why is that? Because it takes a long time to drive at rush hour. You might, you might drive your car into downtown New York at 2 o'clock in the morning, but driving your car into downtown New York City at 7 o'clock in the morning or 8 o'clock in the morning, it's going to take you a long time, right? And then when you get there, you got to find a place to park, etc. So what do we find? We find that low-income people ride the bus, like you see a bus go by, right? It's not going to be filled with high-income people. It's going to be filled with low-income people because the true cost is the opportunity cost of your time. And if you want people to use mass transit, then you got to figure out ways that will make it so that the opportunity cost of their time is, it's, it's faster mass transit. What do you have? You have express buses, right? There are places where you can, I think you can get an express bus from Chicago to Jackson or something like that, where you can, uh, is that right? It's be, yeah, I think, I think you get an express bus from, from Chicago to Jackson or something like that, where it only stops once or maybe it doesn't stop at all, or maybe to Ann Arbor or something like that. So what, what, are, they, what are they doing there? They're, 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 they're cutting the cost, of the, cutting the cost of, the, of the time down. I mean, or if you see um, uh, high, op high occupancy vehicle lanes, right? What are they trying to do? They make it so that you guys are stuck in the slow traffic, but if you get a bunch of people together and they all drive in the car, then they can use this lane which is faster, right? So it's, it's not a matter, and, and, and so it's a matter of trying to get people to uh, uh, have a lower opportunity cost of their time. So a um, last point is that we'll make today is that um, if you don't pay the opportunity cost, what will happen? You'll tend to waste a resource, right? If, if you're not paying the opportunity cost of water, guess what? You're going to grow cotton in the San Joaquin Valley of California, right? Cotton uses up a lot of water. And what do we know about the San Joaquin Valley? It's, it's really a desert, right? Um, and so what do you do? You import water into the San Joaquin Valley in canals. Um, anybody? Ever lived in the San Joaquin Valley or you know, to me? Well, 
There you go. So, or uh, uh, um, uh, Victor Davis Hanson, his, he's got a farm, his, a family farm out in the San Joaquin Valley, right? Um, but the bottom line is you'll tend to waste resources if you're not paying the opportunity costs. So if we want to be efficient, we want to make sure that you're paying the opportunity costs of whatever you're using up, whether it's time or whether it is uh, buying water or whether it is, uh, you know, buying a, a, a car, whatever it is, you got to be paying what's the value of the next best alternative. Uh, and uh, what we'll do next time is we'll talk a little bit about um, why this results in markets being the most efficient way of allocating resources to please consumers. It's, it's got to be. All right, so uh, you should really be looking through chapter five. Is it chapter five that's on supply? Whatever the chapter on supply is. Is it four? Okay, so you really should be looking at chapter four uh, over the weekend. Uh, you don't have to understand it perfectly, but it'll give you an idea of what we're going to be talking about next week. So go ahead and, and look at uh, the chapter on supply and uh, Capitalist Manifesto.